Well, thank you for that amazing introduction. The phrase no pressure springs to mind, so I hope this won't uh, disappoint. Actually, I was told that uh, at this amazing event, we have quite a spectrum of attendees. Some of you are world experts in machine learning. Many of you are actually new to the field of machine learning. And really, I wanted to address this mainly to those of you who are just coming into machine learning or who want uh, to move into this field, which, of course, is just an incredibly exciting field, an amazingly exciting time. But I think it can also be quite daunting. Um, I've been in the field of machine learning for about 30 years. And over that time, of course, literally many thousands of different machine learning algorithms have been developed. We've seen an explosion of interest in the field. The conferences are becoming huge. Thousands of new papers published every year. I suspect as a newcomer, you're thinking, where do I begin? Do I have to learn all of these different machine learning algorithms? And in particular, and this is the applied machine learning event, if you're trying to solve a real world application, do you need to know all of these different techniques? Do you need to read all of those papers? What happens in practice, of course, is that often we adopt uh, an empirical approach. You'll try out various different algorithms with various different parameters, and you'll tweak them, and you'll compare them until you get something that's good enough. But perhaps your choice is influenced by the ones you're familiar with or the software that you happen to have. How do you know you've got the best algorithm for your particular application without trying them all? So I want to give you a perspective on machine learning, which I call the model-based view of machine learning, which I hope will guide you through this uh, very complex and challenging space and help you identify the best approach for your particular application. And it goes back to a very important piece of uh, mathematics, a theorem, uh, which has this lovely title, No Free Lunch Theorem, uh, attributed usually to Wolpert back in 96. And it says that if we average over all possible data generating distributions, and you can think of that as sort of averaging over all the kinds of applications that you might ever want to, to work on, um, average over all possible data distributions, every classification algorithm has the same error rate when classifying previously unobserved points. In other words, on average, every algorithm is just as good or just as bad as any other algorithm. It tells us there's no such thing as a universal algorithm. There's no one best algorithm. So if you like, the bad news is that you can't just ignore all of those different algorithms and just work with the best algorithm, because there is no such thing as the best algorithm. It'll depend on the problem you're trying to solve. And that's not just an opinion, it's a piece of mathematics. Now, of course, you've all heard of deep learning and deep neural networks, and you may have come away with the impression that that is the universal algorithm that solves all of humanity's problems, and you can ignore everything else. I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment and why that's not the case. So the Murphy Lunch theorem tells that there, is that there is no universal machine learning algorithm. In other words, the goal of machine learning is not to find the universal algorithm, it doesn't exist, but instead to find a particular algorithm that's well matched to the specific problem that you're trying to solve. So machine learning then has, has two components. Of course, it's based on data. We want to learn from the data. But we also need to know something about the specific task that we're solving. So there's something about the domain. We could call this domain knowledge. I'll tend to refer to this as prior knowledge. We could also call it bias. And there's a lovely resonance with Joanna's superb talk this morning. I'll also show you that you cannot learn just from data. You need prior knowledge, constraints, uh, or if you like, bias. And that bias may or may not have technical overtone, uh, ethical overtones, but from a technical point of view, you can only learn from data in the context of assumptions. So if you say, I don't want to make assumptions, I just want to let the data speak for themselves, then you run into the no free lunch theorem, and you can learn nothing just from the data. So you, you might have this intuition, and this intuition turns out to be correct, that if you have very strong prior knowledge, if you have a lot of detailed, precise background knowledge about the problem you're trying to solve, then a little bit of data will go a long way. You can learn a lot from a small amount of data. Conversely, if you only have very weak, rather generic, prior knowledge about the problem, then you're going to need large amounts of data in order to achieve good results. 
And that intuition is broadly correct, but we need to be careful about what we mean by the amount of data. So there are two quite different measures of the size of a data set. The first measure is what I'll call the computational size of the data set, which is how many bytes does that data take up on disk? Just how physically how big is the data in terms of the number of bits that it occupies? That's the computational size. This is the size of a data set in a different sense, a statistical measure of the size of a data set, which is really to do with its information content in relation to the problem we're trying to solve. So let me try and explain that with a couple of, if you like, corner cases. So I'll give you two somewhat artificial examples. In one case, it's a data set that's computationally small but statistically large, and then I'll show you the converse. So let's imagine we've got the following problem. We've got a lump of metal, and we're going to apply a voltage across the piece of metal, and we'll measure the current. Uh, we'll make a number of measurements. So each measurement is a pair of values, the applied voltage and the resulting current. And our goal is to predict the current for some new value of voltage that we haven't yet measured. So that's the problem of generalization, and that's what makes this a machine learning problem. So what current will we get if we apply that new voltage? Now, in this case, we can go and talk to our local friendly physicist and discover that the relationship between current and voltage for a piece of metal is described by Ohm's law. In other words, they're just directly proportional. So there's really only one parameter that we need to learn from the data, which is the slope of this line. That's the, uh, related to the resistance of that piece of metal. So in this case, we have very strong prior knowledge. There's a very precise, very simple relationship between current and voltage. They're simply proportional to each other. And with this very strong prior knowledge, um, even this small amount of data is sufficient to give very good predictions. You'll see that the actual measurements there are a little bit noisy. And of course, in the real world, whenever we measure something, we always have noise on those measurements. So we won't be able to predict the current exactly at that new voltage. But the point is, this is a data set which is computationally very small. It's just uh, seven pairs of floating point numbers. So from a computational size point of view, it's tiny. From a statistical size, it's very large. We're only trying to learn now one parameter. And given seven noisy data points, we can make a pretty good estimate of that. So we make a prediction for the current at the new value of voltage that would have very little uncertainty. And if I gave you another million measurements of current and voltage, of course, you'd make better predictions. The uncertainty would go down a bit, but it wouldn't change significantly. So that's a data set that's computationally small but statistically large. Let's take a different problem. Let's imagine we have images, and the goal is to label the images according to the object they contain. So we want to label the images as uh, airplane or boat or bicycle and so on. Now, each image might have. Um, millions of pixels, so each uh, image occupies a significant amount of space on disk, and we might have millions of images of each class, so this is a computationally uh, large data set. But let's suppose we're a little bit naive, and we're going to just treat these images as just vectors that we're going to classify. How much data do we need before we can start to do a good job of recognizing the difference between aeroplanes and bicycles? Well, if you think about an aeroplane, uh, an image of an aeroplane, that aeroplane could be in um, any position within the image, any distance from the image. So three degrees of freedom of translation. It can also be oriented in different ways. So we've got three degrees of freedom of rotation. Um, it can have different colors. It can have different lighting conditions. Uh, there are many factors uh, which can vary from one image to another. And they can all occur in combination. And in all cases, they would be images of aeroplanes. So I could stand here and show you images, one a second. Every image, you would all agree, was an image of an aeroplane. Uh, and yet we'd be here far, far longer than the age of the universe before we'd even begun to scratch the surface of all the possible images of aeroplanes. So the space of, the space of possible images, of course, is enormous. But within that, the space of images of aeroplanes is enormous. And even a million examples of aeroplanes would be almost like a vacuum within that space. So that would be a data set where if we had a million examples of each class, it would be uh, statistically an extremely small data set, but computationally a very large data set. In practice, of course, we can solve problems like recognizing airplanes in images because we build in much more prior knowledge than just treating them as vectors. I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. <laughs> 
So the idea then of model-based machine learning is to take a different perspective. Rather than think about those thousands of different algorithms and having to compare them all, um, instead is to go back to the, the idea of that no-free lunch theorem, the idea that we're trying to, uh, we're trying to formulate constraints or prior knowledge or biases uh, which are informed by our domain knowledge and which allow us to extract useful information from the data and produce good results. So the dream of model-based machine learning is, in fact, just to derive the appropriate algorithm by making those assumptions explicit insofar as we can. So in the traditional view of machine learning, we say, how do I map my problem onto standard algorithms and take this sort of trial and error approach? In a model-based view, our goal is to define the model which represents the problem you're trying to solve. So instead of thinking of the machine learning algorithm as the first class citizen, we'll think instead of what we'll call the model, and the model is application specific. The model is simply the set of assumptions or biases or prior knowledge that's appropriate for the particular task that you wish to solve. That's combined with some inference method, and I won't talk much about inference, but you'll have heard of things like gradient descent or expectation propagation. These tend to be rather generic methods, and together, the model and the inference method together define an algorithm. Now, a little caveat here is that in practice, we usually can't do exact inference. So there are approximations when we do inference at scale, and those approximations themselves can affect the outcome of the, the application. So that's really just the caveat that if things are not working perfectly, it may be because of an issue with the data, of course. If the data is corrupt or bad data, you can get poor results. It may be that the inference approximations you're making uh, are causing issues. But it very often can be the case that the assumptions you're making are not appropriate to the particular problem that you're trying to address. So that model-based view, if you like, provides you with a compass that allows you to navigate that vast space of possible algorithms. So I'm going to pick, pick a particular example. It's one of the simplest, you can call it machine learning algorithms. It's a, a statistical method. It's been around for many years. It's called PCA, or Principal Component Analysis. And you can think of it a way of, a way of taking data in a high-dimensional space and compressing it or mapping it down onto a lower-dimensional space. Um, and if you're not familiar with this, it doesn't matter. Just you, you get the spirit of, uh, of, of, uh, of this example. So we can view Principal Component Analysis as an algorithm. You look it up, it's a recipe. It's a set of steps that you follow. And it says, take the, the data point. So x uh, is a, a vector in some d-dimensional space. Uh, take all the n data points in your data set and compute the average. Find the mean of those data points. Subtract off the mean and compute this thing, which is called the sample covariance matrix. Find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the sample covariance matrix. And then retain some subset m less than d of the eigenvectors. So you can think of this as a big sort of d-dimensional Euclidean space, and we're going to find uh, a Euclidean subspace of lower dimension at some position and orientation, such that effectively we're rejecting the data down onto that subspace in a way that preserves uh, maximum variance. So that's PCA viewed as a recipe. So you might apply PCA to your particular problem, um, and you might get just the results you need, and you're done. But what happens if the results are not good enough? What if PCA doesn't do what you need? What do you do next? It's sort of hard to know, because you've just got a recipe. <clears throat> the recipe doesn't work. What do you do? Go find another recipe and try that one. So let's look at PCA again, but this time let's look at it from a, a model-based perspective. So this is a, a little piece of graphical notation called a factor graph. Um, and I don't have time to give a tutorial on, a factor, on what factor graphs are, but it's a graphical way of representing a little piece of mathematics. What this says is that we're going to construct some little vectors, z, which live in that low-dimensional, m-dimensional space, and they're going to be drawn from a Gaussian distribution. And we're going to pick one of these vectors at random from a, a, a spherical Gaussian distribution sitting in this, this m-dimensional space. We're going to project it up into the high dimensional data space. I'm going to add some Gaussian noise. Now, again, if you're not familiar with the terminology, it doesn't matter. What we're describing here is what we call a generative process. It's a sequence of events by which we create data points in our imagination, as it were. Another little notation here, we wrap this in a box and label it N. That means everything you see inside the box is copied N times. It's called a plate for other historical reasons. 
but it's um, simply a replicate of, of everything you see in the, in, inside the box. And what it says is that repeat the following n times. Choose a, a, a Gaussian point in this m-dimensional space, project it into the data space and add Gaussian noise and then sample from it. And that generates one synthetic data point and do that n times. So that's a little thought experiment for how you believe the data got generated. So that's capturing the prior knowledge. That is our domain knowledge. It's our beliefs in how we think that data came into existence. Uh, we can think of that as modeling. That's our model description. However, in reality, we don't generate those data synthetically. We observe them. So the, the shading means those X points are the things we observe. We actually have to reverse the process. We call that process inference. And for those of you familiar with probability theory, this is essentially Bayes' theorem, or a version of Bayes' theorem, which allows us to invert probabilities. So we run inference, and it turns out that mathematically, this is exactly equivalent to PCA. They're identical. So what I've done is derive PCA by what probably seems like a bit of a long-winded process, but it's been derived by starting from some modeling assumptions, these linear Gaussian generative assumptions. The inference method here is just the thing called maximum likelihood, which says choose the parameters of those distributions and that linear mapping in order to maximize the probability of the observed data. So what have we achieved? This is just a way of deriving that recipe. The point now is that supposing those assumptions, supposing that model doesn't work very well, we need to change something. We might, for instance, believe that the noise process is not isotropic, it's different for different measurements. So we could allow the variance to be different on the different axes of the data space instead of being shared. It turns out that that's another ancient algorithm called factor analysis. But the point is you didn't need to know that it was called factor analysis. You didn't need to read the literature. All you need to do is to change the modeling assumptions, run inference, and the correct thing will happen. Um, Let's suppose that you don't believe that those data points are generated independently. Well, modeling assumptions, we generate endpoints one after another independently. What if uh, we're tracking an aircraft across the sky using a radar? The measurements are the successive radar returns, and they're not independent, of course. They're highly correlated because the aircraft's moving, moving smoothly across the sky. Our goal is to determine the true position of the airplane but the measurement we make using the radar is noisy, so it has errors. Uh, let's say once a second we make a measurement while the aeroplane is moving. Um, what should we do? What, what recipe should we use to process the data to tell us where the aeroplane really is? Well, your intuition might say, if these are noisy measurements, if I average them, I'll average out the noise, I'll get a more accurate estimate of where the aeroplane is. Well, intuition is good intuition, except the aeroplane is moving. So you're averaging across different positions. You're blurring out that uh, location information. So you might say, well, hang on. What I'll do instead is I'll just take the most recent measurement. And sure, it's noisy, but at least I'm not averaging across the motion. Yes, that's true, but you're discarding those earlier data points. You're throwing away useful information. So you think about it a little bit more. You think, well, maybe what I should do is to give a lot of weight to the most recent measurement a little bit of average in a bit of the previous measurement, maybe a little bit of the one before, and so on, tailing off in some sort of decay. And that intuition is correct. That's what you should do. But the question is, how much should you weight the previous measurement and the one before, and so on? You're back to a recipe, and you're back to trial and error. So instead, let's just build a model of that process. And the model is just another simple extension of principal components analysis. So mu is the true position of the aeroplane, x is the noisy measurement, and at time one, we make this noisy measurement. At time step two, the aeroplane's moved on a little bit. And we can model that because we know the current, if we knew the current position, mu, the current position, so mu is the position and speed of, and velocity of the aeroplane. If we know the position and velocity, we can predict where it's going to be one second later. Uh, and then we get a noisy measurement of that position, and so on. So our model is that the aeroplane's moving across the sky, and once a second, we're making measurements of its changing position and velocity. Now what we're going to do is observe those noisy measurements. We're going to run inference, and we're going to compute the position and velocity at each point, including the latest position and velocity. 
Well, it turns out that this thing has a name. Um, it's called the Kalman filter. Now, uh, about 10 years ago, when I was writing a book on machine learning, I wanted a chapter on time series methods, and I decided to read some books on Kalman filters. And at least my view was that they were pretty hard work. You have to read through several chapters to discover these equations. Um, it, was, it was sort of pretty hard work to, to get to grips with what a Kalman filter was all about. It actually turns out the idea is incredibly simple. And not only is this by far the simplest way of explaining what a Kalman filter is, but it turns out the way you do inference, and again, not time today to talk about this, the way you do inference on these graphs is send little messages around the graph. It's a very simple, very generic algorithm that you can derive in about a page or so. And a special case of this is the Kalman filtering. The Kalman filtering and Kalman smoothing equations are just a special case of this. And this is by far the simplest way I know of deriving those equations. But guess what? Supposing the unknown quantities are not the position of an aeroplane, which is a continuous quantity, but some sort of discrete quantity. Mu is now discrete. Well, the graph is the same. The assumptions are the same. Uh, it's now called the hidden Markov model. The hidden Markov model was developed independently by a different community, published in a different literature, using a different notation. But it's exactly the same, just forward and backward message passing. And we can see explicitly the assumptions that are being made. What if those assumptions are not quite correct? What if that transition from one state to another is not linear? Well, again, we can model this. So you can examine the assumptions that you're making, bake them into the model, and when you run inference, you should get the algorithm that best describes the, the problem you're trying to solve. Um, I mentioned deep learning and deep neural networks. They're very popular. Are they universal algorithms that make no assumptions? Well, not really. Here's, if you like, the simplest neural network, logistic regression. It makes a very strong assumption that the output is a nonlinear transform of some linear combination of those features. And a single-layer neural network is really a set of those running in parallel. Deep neural networks have many layers of such processing. They're actually applied in many different domains, but they have a lot of structure and knowledge built into them. And in particular, they have this hierarchical structure. If I'm trying to, if I want to take a photograph and I want to label that photograph as, let's say, happy or sad, then we need that hierarchical structure. The lowest levels will detect uh, contrast, the next levels will detect edges, the next levels will detect corners, the corners will be combined together into shapes, the shapes will become objects, they become objects like people, people who have facial expressions, objects like birthday cakes and candles, facial expressions like smiles, and together that's evidence that this is a happy picture. And it's arrived at through this hierarchical process. So the hierarchical nature of deep networks is an assumption, it's a modeling assumption, one that seems to work well in many, uh, in many applications. Um, but often we need much more than that. So there isn't, we can't just treat a deep neural network as some universal algorithm that solves all problems. So very often we need other forms of prior knowledge. Let me just show you one example. I want to classify an image according to whether there's a person in the image. And I have a piece of prior knowledge. I know that all of these are pictures of people, irrespective of where in the image the person occurs. One way of, of tackling this is to train my system using a very large data set, which contains not only people of all different sizes and shapes and so on, but in all positions in the image as well. So a very large data set. Uh, that's problematic, getting hold of such large amounts of data. One thing people sometimes do is to take one image and then translate it many times, synthesize artificial data in order to augment the data, and that can work well. But in this case, really, we want to be able to just give it one example of a person at the middle of the image and say, as a piece of prior knowledge rather than a data augmentation, Tell it to recognize that as a person, irrespective of their position. We call that uh, translation invariance. And so in neural networks, we do that with structures like convolutional structures. So this is a thing called a convolutional neural network. Uh, we have an image at the input layer. In the convolutional layer, each node looks at a little patch of the previous layer. The nearby node looks at a nearby patch, but those nodes share weights. The weights are, are, are adjustable, they're learned, but they're constrained to be the same from one node to the next. So if a feature appears in a particular location and triggers that node in the convolutional layer, the same feature translated a bit will trigger the, the corresponding node translated in the convolutional layer. And the next day we do a subsampling. We do something like a little max of the nodes in a particular region. So irrespective of where that feature occurs, irrespective of which convolutional node lights up, the subsampling layer node will always light up. 
So we've got a little bit of translation invariance. And now we stack these. We have many such pairs of uh, convolutional and subsampling layers, gradually building up translation invariance till now we can recognize objects anywhere in the image and even do local translation invariance. So we know that if we, uh, if we stretch one part of the image and, and squish another part, the identity of the object typically is unchanged, and that, again, is baked into that structure. So that's an example of deep neural networks and deep learning, but containing very important domain knowledge. So uh, let me just leave you with this. This is a new book. It's uh, um, authored by John Wynne, who's very much the main author. I'm very much the secondary author. Uh, and many others have contributed. It's called Model-Based Machine Learning. Uh, it's a free um, online book. It's interactive. It's about three quarters written. Uh, we welcome your feedback. It's unusual because each chapter is a real-world case study. So in each case, we pose a real-world problem. We talk about the data. We talk about the prior knowledge that we have. We define the model, choose an inference method, run the algorithm, get the results, and we discover that it doesn't work very well because that's always the way it happens in practice. And then we go back and we debug. Was it a problem with the data? Was it a problem with the inference? Or was there some problem with the assumptions? Do we need to modify the assumptions? And of course, each chapter has a happy ending. Where finally, we get good results, uh, and it leads to a real-world application. Uh, and I thought I'd finish coming back to the comment I made at the beginning about uh, people who are newcomers to the field. Um, I've been in machine learning for 30 years, but this is just an amazingly exciting time to be coming into the field. Um, it's a time when skills in this space are in huge demand. And I think it's a sign of the times, really, that we are introducing, uh, Microsoft is introducing the AI residency program, which we're actually launching today. And it really is a training program, an on-the-job training program. So it's one year full time. Uh, residents get to work on real world projects, uh, developing solutions across a huge range of domains training and mentorship, and applications close on 30th of March. Talk to Jennifer on the, uh, at the careers fair if you're interested in more. Um, but this is extraordinary, really, in a sense, because um, typically, if you want to spend a year being educated and trained and acquire some new skills, you might go to a, uh, a famous university like EPFL, uh, and typically you pay fees, and then you receive an education. Here, you're going to get paid a full-time competitive market salary for a year while you get to work on real-world applications for about 80% of the time. The other 20% will be structured education, tutorials, reading groups, and so on. Uh, and the reason we're doing this is because the demand now for people with applied machine learning skills is huge, uh, far outstripping supply. And I predict it's going to get much worse in the next few years. And so we're introducing this residency program to help address that. And uh, the residencies, the first round of residencies will start in September. And to the best of my knowledge, this is the first AI residency program to operate outside of the US. So we're very proud of this. All right, thank you very much.